We're gonna do a map video. Who doesn't like map videos? So if you guys didn't notice, in a very recent patch, as far as I'm aware, right after Daybreak came out, the world map was updated once again this now extremely hefty large world map was updated again so just to be clear we had core released and we had this map then heart of thorns released after you know the experimentation of season one and season two and it didn't expand on the boundaries that was something that disappointed me i wanted to see a little bit more over on this coast beyond uh the maguma jungle but they were very minimal with what they added they didn't expand the world map then finally, uh, Living World Season 3 came out, didn't expand the map, but Path of Fire did. Uh, and it added like this massive new chunk of land to about, what was it, about here we could see? Uh, so we got all of this major stuff down here to the south. It added Dizlana and Dijaka as region names, and obviously we got the regular maps. Then we had Daybreak, and amazingly, Daybreak also increased the, the map. It extended it even further south down to here to reveal the Isle of Istan. Now, uh, some of the more jammy of us in the community through data mining and extracting the map itself had already seen this stuff of Istan and knew that the, it was just the client, the game client that wasn't showing it to us. But now we've got even this, which is huge and even more. There's still a lot of stuff, as far as I'm aware, off on the right that they're still not showing us. Like, I know for a fact there's a blue lake over there and stuff. But uh, it was another expansion when Daybreak Right came out. Then there was this patch. Okay, and what this patch did was it didn't expand the boundaries, but it did update the art on the map. Uh, and if you've not already noticed it, probably the most prominent major thing here is what has just happened here with the brand. And so that's what I want to talk about here from the safety of this library, uh, as well as a really interesting post uh, from that shaman, which talks about some other minor changes that have been suggested uh, based on the art here and could give us some great ideas as to where Living World uh, Season 4 is going and there's a very big thing in it, it seems. So, uh, let's first just talk about the brand. Now, this is really important. Seeing that Kraukatorik started all the way up here in core, he moved down to here. And then when uh, Path of Fire came out, it like tacitly moved it over here. We all thought that, well, most of us thought that Kraukatorik would be a big, you know, final ba boss battle. This would be the last map or something. Big brand style thing like Straits of Devastation or uh, Dragon Stand. We'd defeat him and then maybe that would be the end of the expansion. That never happened in the end, as you all know. Um, and instead, Kraukatorik survived. And at the end of Path of Fire, we find ourselves in the Amnune Oasis. And uh, we see the Amnune Oasis like gets attacked by Brandstorm. Uh, we see, which suggests that Kraukatorik moved this way. We see the uh, dragon moving towards the Rising Sun, which suggests he moved east. As long as the Rising Sun on Tyria is in the east, and I'm pretty sure it is. I don't remember anything that deliberately contradicts that. Uh, we had the devs in an AMA that said he went west, I think it was, or did they say south? There were lots of contradictory things. So it's really important to get this map update with Daybreak, not just to include Istan, but the one later that shows this was his movement, okay? This is very clear. This is what Kraukatorik did, and I think there's a lot of interesting things we can get from this. First, you might look at his psychology and say, all right, well, why did, why did Kraukatorik do this? You would have assumed that after he'd moved here and feasted on magic, he'd be going to another source of magic. In fact, they never really explained his initial movement that well, in my opinion. Uh, he seems to have just sort of been supercharged and just moved. It doesn't seem like there was any specific direction. You'll notice that one idea has basically been shot in the head already. And that's that Season 4 was going to take us following Kraukatorik continually south until eventually we get to Canther or something. And then he gets exploded by the Canthans down there who don't know any better or something. Uh, but that didn't happen. It seems he's come here. And once again, we find ourselves in a similar position to when Path of Fire was releasing. Where it looks like, oh, this is going to be our final boss battle. This is like the 2012 Glint Slayer, 2017 original Path of Fire uh, new boss area. And now it's finally here. Is this finally where we're going to take the pact with Logan and so forth and defeat Kraukatorik? Well, who knows? So it is kind of interesting um, to note exactly where he did land uh, because we can compare this to Guild Wars 1 locations. This is actually entirely unexplorable in the original game. A lot of this stuff uh, in Path of Fire has been retreading old ground, you know, the Crystal Desert. So if you played GW1, you got all that extra lore geek out stuff when you saw stuff to do with Ascension and so forth. Uh, you had a little bit of unexplored areas between uh, the two continents, but then we were in the Desolation and we were in Vabi and, you know, it was all very familiar, right? You had the Return to the Tomb of the Primeval Kings. 
if this really is going to be a map, a big place that we end up going, it's interesting that this is uh, a place we haven't seen at all. Even Istan, right, is places from Guild Wars 1. This was inaccessible. This is basically a northwestern coast to corner that we never got to visit. There was hints here in the original game that these were like snow-capped mountainy style areas. Very minimal, but they were there. Uh, the places we got to explore them was about over here, okay? Um, and then we got to go uh, up here. Uh, Chirai's Procession was a map. And then we entered the Desolation, and this was actually explorable. But none of this, this wasn't actually available. So the devs can really play with this. Uh, they could just make it a barren wasteland that Krakatorix attacked, and there's nothing really going on. Or they can establish that people lived here we just never met before, and uh, now they have their own struggles. Uh, I will note as well, obviously, when Path of Fire came out, they added Dajka. And Dajka seems to be named after a Guild Wars 1 location called the Dajka In Inlet, which was, like, down here. So, given that this was the Dashka Inlet, and this is what they called Dashka, is it fair to say that Kralkatorik landed in Dashka? Well, I guess we'll see. I actually did a video on that fairly recently, uh, as to how mysterious of a land Dashka could be. But you'll remember that uh, Istan also did a lot of stuff with Corsairs, which is great, because Corsairs were a big part of Istan, but uh, the suggestion that these are sort of Ist uh, Corsair-infested waters that might now have some kind of more of a stake in the story because Kralkatorix got so close to them, could be very cool. And then they're stating the obvious, which is, look, he's right on the borders of the desolation. And I think that this is going to be something we'll definitely see in Season 4, which is ArenaNet setting up some kind of conflict between Joko and not Balthazar in, uh, anymore, as we saw we were rallying his Awakened against Balthazar's forces before, but instead Kralkatorik. Kralkatorik is really pushing on Joko's uh, domain here. Not quite, He's not quite in the desolation, but I mean, as, uh, the other perspective is you could consider all of Alona Joko's domain now, and he's going to be pretty peeved at all of this. Once upon a time, it was just a thing on the fringes, and now he's sort of scarred his way right through corner. So that's really what I have to say about where he's landed. The fact that he's landed somewhere we've never seen before kind of restricts what we have to say, but I will point out I'm quite excited by that as well. You know, I'm a Guild Wars 1 law nerd. You'll see in a ton of these videos, I'm super excited about returning to Guild Wars 1 uh, locations. But I have had my fill of it now, I think. And I am really looking forward to going to totally new places uh, like Dajaka and Dizlana. And we will see uh, whether this big uh, location even means anything in the end. Because it might not. Something might happen and then Krakatog just flies off again straight through the unending ocean. And we're away. So another thing I'll point out when we look at the oceans, by the way, is you might have noticed in the Daybreak release, um, if you've played it, that instead of just taking an airship from, say, Vabi, right, down to Istan, which wouldn't have been too bad, uh, or even an airship from anywhere, Christ, we actually took a boat from the harbour. And I've noticed a few other people have been wondering this. It immediately struck me. It's kind of a weird route, isn't it? I mean, we'd have to go this way, unless there's some kind of canal that somebody's dug here, which we've obviously never heard of. We'd have to go all the way around Or, and then all the way down to Istan to finally land down here. You might wonder why this obnoxious, ridiculous route was taken. Well, the answer is probably because of the brand, and that wasn't evident right when the patch came out. But it's probably because... All these brand storms, you can't just easily cut across anymore. You know, this stuff stretches far into the sky. It's threatening. We even hear as a part of the main story, and this isn't very spoiler heavy, but we hear that Krakatorix basically got a new trick where he can just summon storms where, you know, at, at great distances far away from the brand, which is what we saw happening at Am Noon. So, kind of the threat there of traveling by airship, I get that maybe we want to take a wide berth. It was just very, uh, you know, uh, pushed to the side. They didn't really explain it very well. And, um, you know, this huge uh, voyage that we went on is just suddenly cut past uh, through a loading screen. I was actually really hoping for some kind of instance on the boat. Uh, maybe we'll get something like that one day, but who knows. So there you go. Uh, so that's, that's the movement. That's the brand. A couple of other things I do want to talk about as well. And that's where he went when he got to his final location. This is nowhere we've been, but this is actually a lot of explorable stuff from Guild Wars 1. This is like an explorable map. Well, I'm, I'm painting the boxes kind of terribly. There's a lot of stuff here. So, uh, some key locations that he did travel through. Underground around here is a place called the Baddock Caverns. In Guild Wars 1, when we're in corner, we're on the run. And we need to sneakily get into Vabi to seek aid. The only, like, above-ground comfortable route that there was, was uh, there was a giant garrison there that we couldn't um, easily pass. So we had to sneak our way through. And we did that by going through the Badok Caverns. We go, uh, you know, through the dark routes. Uh, we listen to Dunquarry's advice. And we pop out in the southern areas of Vabi. Those caverns now appear to be branded pretty heavily. And so, uh, is that just going to scar the surface and the caverns are okay underneath? 
or whether that have dug the whole way down. I actually really like the idea of a map that's like multiple layered. A bit like, and you guys are going to cringe when you hear this, but a bit like Tangled Depths, in that Tangled Depths, you had a lot of surface stuff and then loads of stuff going on underwater. It doesn't have to be such a ridiculous na labyrinth and innavigable, but I would like the idea of having brand above and then regular places we can explore underneath. Though the idea that it's also, you know, really difficult to traverse. I like those kinds of maps, and it would make sense. It would be faithful to the Guild Wars 1 vision of what that place was like. So I don't know. Anyway, you've got Badock Caverns. You notice it just pips the garrison here, which I'll talk about in a second. Uh, uh, another pretty key location that it hits, maybe, is uh, a location about here called the Venter Cemetery. So um, this is one of the most northern reaches of Corner. It's where we actually set off to go north. Uh, the site of lots of centaur activity, actually. And uh, now all of these uh, graves, basically, uh, Kraukatorik's flown over. Now that's interesting because the end of Path of Fire did suggest to us that Kraukatorik, perhaps having absorbed some Zaitan magic, could resurrect and then brand things. I think he did it to like a Devourer or something in the last cutscene, right? And so the idea that he's gone right over this cemetery, that's something really fun that the writers can play off of, where they basically suggest that all these old centaur bodies and things have now come up and they're now branded, and that's like an extra capability of Kraukatorik's, and guess what, they've just had him fly over a goddamn cemetery. It's also a nice reason to look back at the centaurs who haven't had a look in edgewise in this region of the world, even though they're a big part of this region of the world. And I know they gave a, a good reason for writing them out in that Joko sort of turned them all into bones and built his palace out of them, but it would, it's, it's some good subject material I see uh, they've got a good chance with. Now, returning to Krakatorik's potential conflict with Palawa Joko here, there is another big thing, and that is that it seems to have flown, the brand has flown basically right over Palawa Joko's tomb. So, this is uh, the site that the Order of Whispers watched over for many years, and uh, had Joko sealed up until eventually, finally, the weakening of the realms of Abaddon released him. And uh, we followed him and got his help to get through the desolation. And then we sort of supported him and minor ways up there. So uh, this is where Joko was trapped for hundreds of years. Remember, this is not his first rise. He had another one. He was defeated by Chirai, imprisoned for hundreds of years until 250 years ago when the Guild Wars 1 heroes were about. So, um, Krakatoa has now flown over that. How do we feel about that? Does that is that more reason for Joko to dislike him? Well, I don't know really because surely Joko doesn't have any nice memories of that place. It's weird though because I was really excited went on an inevitable return to Corner. I was really excited to come back to this tomb to see how Joko had treated it since his rise and since his subjugation of all these people. What has he done to it? Destroyed it? Made sure that nobody knows it exists? Built a giant monument of his own over it? What's he done? And now I feel like we've almost been robbed of that because the brand's there. I suppose the answer is that all of that could have happened. Joko could have done interesting stuff and now it's even more interesting because the brand's there too. But I must say, whenever I've been in branded areas in Guild Wars 2, I always feel like the brand just like so wholly transforms the landscape. It kind of robs it of its past history. The only place I've been really excited is like where the Great Northern War hit the brand. So I don't know. Maybe maybe they'll still be able to do something cool. And how does that affect the story and the psychology of Joko? I'm, I'm unclear. Um, it's also worth noting there was a funny, weird quest uh, with the, the Chantry of Secrets and the Order of Whispers in the first game where they, they also, I think, revealed that there was basically a Titan buried around there and they like reused the same tomb. And I don't know whether this whole resurrection thing will mean anything. We, I guess we'll see. Um, but yeah, so, and I, was there a suggestion that other things were buried with Joko in that tomb? I don't remember. That would also be really interesting, wouldn't it? Uh, with this, like, resurrection idea. Anyway, that's really not the point of the video. Those are some interesting places that you went over. Now, uh, a couple of things as well that I'll point out that are safe from the brand, but very close. Underground at an old Melanju temple slash waterworks, there was the Sunspear Sanctuary. When we were on the run, we built that up. This is where uh, we did a lot of interaction with Lonai, who's got lots of hints in this patch we'll get to very shortly in another video. Um, so the Sunspear Sanctuary is okay. All of the corn and garrisons. So there were like six different, five different explorable maps in corner, right? And each of them had a garrison in them where you could, uh, there was a commander who you could get a different elite skill from. Uh, all of them are safe from the brand. All of them. And presumably, Palawas, you, you know, enforce those to some degree. And uh, they're all safe and they could be major strikeout points. We don't know. Gandara, the Moon Fortress, is obviously safe down here as well. And a really important one that's safe, back up on the fringes of Abbey now, is the Chantry of Secrets, uh, somewhere around here, uh, which was also safe from the brand. So those are big locations that are all totally okay. And that's really what we've got to dig into from this movement. So uh, hopefully you found something interesting in that already, guys. But one more thing I'd like to close the video out on, and all credit to that shaman here for the amazing Reddit thread he made on this. 
uh, uh, pointing this out. As you guys know, Shaman does a lot of very interesting, cool map work. Uh, he ha he hosts a website called the Historical Guide to Terria that overlays both Guild Wars 1 and Guild Wars 2 maps beautifully together. It's always so interesting to look at when they expand the map and, you know, when Isten came out to compare the two. Uh, he has noted that when this brand update came in, several other almost imperceptible changes occurred on the world map. And I want to talk about those two. So, first of all, Dashka. Dashka we already talked about. I think it will obviously have some relevance. Uh, there are some very slight changes to the seas and waters around here. And what's that suggested? Well, pot potentially nothing, but potentially also that maybe we'll get a, you know, a kind of coastal city, a bit like I hope, uh, map, sorry. Uh, a bit like I'm hoping the Isna Isles will be, which was absolutely gorgeous, by the way, and everyone should be excited about. Maybe we'll get, like, a really Corsair-heavy map here at some point, and the overworld map has changed, laying the way for that. You'll remember there were some slight changes to the coastland than here, the coastline. Quite a while before POF, and then this all ended up becoming a thing. So I think we can really look at that. So there's that. Very minor, but it's there. Uh, another thing also that's pretty cool that appeared is over here. There's a place in Guild Wars 1 that you travel through called the Mankellen Waterworks. It's a mission that uh, is kind of an op optional thing. You can choose to do it, or you can do a different mission. Um, but you fight a, a powerful demon called the Drought there that has been, uh, you know, ruining the water and uh, evaporating the water. It's a demon that Abaddon had summoned and that had been manipulated, I guess, by the Cornans and Varish. I don't remember the particulars anymore. But, uh, you know, it had been basically putting the Cornan people into drought and making them easier to subjugate from Varesh as she was trying to enact Nightfall. And so uh, the Man Mankellum Waterworks, I believe these are them. These are the buildings. They weren't on the world map before, and now they are on the world map. And they're sort of half-branded, too. So they're half in, half out. Uh, and they are here where we fought the drought. Were they really a massive, pivotal place and something of huge importance to go back to? I don't really know. Not unless we're going to start playing with the water again, which was a huge theme um, of the original Nightfall campaign. Unless that's going to become a big part of the story, I don't know. But they're there on the map, and maybe we'll visit them now. Uh, another big location, much bigger this time, is uh, actually uh, slightly to the northwest of it. And it's what I mentioned earlier. This is the Jahai Fortress. This is the big garrison that blocked the path to Vabi, forcing us to go through the Baddock Caverns, okay? And so uh, this was a really cool place. You could actually see a Nightfallen Abaddon Vision place. It just avoided the brand here. And this building, this, this blip, this did not exist on the map until this update. So it's good to see that there because that is a huge landmark. You would have thought that because the Chantry is so secret, that might, uh, close, sorry, they might have done something there. But they didn't. And so one other thing, uh, as far as Alona is concerned, uh, is down here. So this is Gandara the Moon Fortress. Giant city. Really exciting place. Uh, the site of a siege from the Astani in GW1 that failed and lost because of Varish's demons. Uh, Cormir gets her eyes eaten out and goes MIA for a while. When we uh, find her, we realize she's been thrown in jail in an offshore island. Kind of like Guild Wars' Alcatraz. Connected by a very thin, long bridge. And you can uh, ally with Magrid the Sly, the Corsair, to uh, try and sneak in and free her. Um, and so this is where she was actually being held. This is called the Bokos Prison. This here was not on the world map either before this map update. So this is here. So there are suggestions here that we could get a map here. We could get a map here. We could get a map somewhere around here. Eventually, perhaps, here. Uh, lots of great stuff to chew on now. That's not it. There's one final change that is a total mind blow, and I'll close the video on that's very exciting, and I really want to hear what you guys say about it in the comments, and it's not in Alona at all. We spent a good deal of time talking about the brand here, though, didn't we? We talked about where Kraukatorik ended, where he's flown through, where he was when POF came out, where he was when Core came out, but what about where he was way back in Guild Wars 1? Supposedly, there have been some very slight changes to the mountainous areas around the Blood Legion homelands and where Kraukatorik woke up. And I'm not sure exactly where because I think it's a very subtle uh, change. Supposedly, there have been some art changes up there. Now, why might the devs have done that, I wonder? Wow, very thrilling, right? So, I don't know whether that's like really long distance stuff that we'll be seeing in the next expansion or whether they're actually going to try and tackle the Blood Legion homelands or even this transitioner area that we only really saw in Gwen's bonus mission pack mission um, in Living World. And if they do it in Living World, are we excited about that? Are we com comfortable that they can get lots of new enemies and music and environments and, uh, you know, types of trees and stuff? And uh, just general assets to make it really feel like a, 
the region we've all been excited to go to. You know, I've, I've uh, posited a while ago, do people want to see Canther or do they want to see these areas for the next expansion? There's a chance, I guess, that since we're doing lots of Kraukatoric stuff, we might want to be looking at his origins and why he was here at some point, and we may be going north. So there you have it, guys. Uh, some subtle changes to the world map. I love doing videos like this. I hope you enjoyed. I'd love to hear what you think. What's the most interesting part of this? And um, again, all credit to that shaman. You can check the link in the description to see that Reddit thread, his historical guide, and all that good stuff. And uh, yeah, let me know what you guys think. Uh, lots more stuff for Daybreak coming up very soon. I still have an AMA I want to talk to you all about. Catch you next time.